Good evening. This is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. We're broadcasting on a prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 metre amateur radio band and simulcast on 160 metres on 1865 kHz in the 160 meter amateur radio band. We're also streaming via the World Wide Web on YouTube and uh, that can be found from, that channel can be found from the ASV website at www.asv.org.au under the Radio Astronomy tab. We're also broadcasting via the Melbourne Digital TV repeater VK3RTV digital channel number 2 in HD. Good evening everyone, this 10th of December, again very close to Christmas and uh, let's hope that everybody is in good spirits and uh, good health and all that. Good evening anyway everybody, uh, we have an email address too if you wish to uh, uh, send a signal report to the uh, station, uh, the email address is vk3csj at gmail.com, vk3c, uh, sorry, ekh vk3 ekh vk3 echo kilo hotel at gmail.com I'll just repeat that again the email address for the station is vk3 ekh at gmail.com and uh, we are currently viewing the inbox as we speak uh, we also have a discord chat window or a chat window courtesy of discord uh, which is online as I speak g'day to Cassiopeia and Nebs, it's uh, come up online, and Martin, VK7JAH, down in the northwest part of Tasmania, has joined in too. That chat window can be found also via the ASV website at www.asv.org.au under the Radio Astronomy tab. Just look for the Discord uh, reference to Discord and the chat window. Anybody can uh, sign up, it's no big deal. You can remain anonymous or uh, come up with your real name, uh, it's even better. Um, Alright, now uh, we have a, a podcast tonight. Um, let's hope it runs smoothly. Uh, it's the second episode, uh, no, it's the second uh, interview, I should say, uh, of uh, Robert Arrowsmith, episode number 37. And uh, this is uh, 12 months later after the first airing uh, of Astrophys started. Uh, back in 2000 and uh, whatever it was and uh, 12 months later uh, Brendan decided to uh, uh, re-interview or do a second conduct a second interview uh, with the first interviewee and uh, that's uh, Robert Arrowsmith so uh, he's all queued up and ready to go mind you it's a few a couple of years or so ago so the information is a little out of date but what the hell uh, okay and uh, <laughs> I've got a, a string of articles there too, which are leftovers from last week, so we'll see what we can do with uh, all those. Um, anyway, a very pleasant good evening to everybody up at the Dark Sky site uh, that's up there listening to uh, uh, the signal on uh, Steve VK3YJQ's uh, receiver up there. Um, I hope the copy is good and, uh, and everybody is uh, listening in. So a very pleasant good evening to all the folks that are up there at the Leon Mao Dark Sky site getting ready for this year's Star BQ, um, which is uh, kicking off tomorrow at uh, about 2 p.m. onwards till uh, until late, and uh, yeah, it should be it should turn out to be a, a good evening. The weather looks like it's playing nice for uh, for everybody up there too, which is uh, excellent. All right. Um, <clears throat> just the usual rundown for the uh, the society. For those that are tuning in for the first time, the Astronomical Society of Victoria was founded in 1922. It comprises some 1,600 members scattered about the uh, country of Australia and overseas. Membership of the society is open to all persons with an interest in astronomy. The society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for the study among its members, which it is doing. Meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, 
uh, the latter being held on a Saturday night. Meeting start at 8pm at the Mullia Hall, National Herbarium, in Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. Parking is available in Burwood Avenue, Dallas Brooks Drive, and within the observatory grounds near the Great Melbourne Telescope House. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. As a post note to that, uh, we conducted, uh, the ASC conducted its first meeting back at the National Herbarium Hall, the Millia Hall, last Wednesday, and very, very successfully. I'm not sure exactly how many people uh, rocked on up to the meeting, but uh, they were streaming the uh, guest speaker um, to, uh, to the internet and uh, in the wide angle view uh, that was done a couple of times uh, uh, it seemed to be at least 50 people uh, maybe 40, 40, 50 people were uh, popping into the very first meeting after about 20 months or so uh, this is the first to get back to uh, back to the meeting uh, hall in Melbourne which was really fantastic so congratulations to all those guys who managed to uh, to get that all working successfully and uh, of course uh, the speaker uh, was absolutely extraordinary what she had to uh, to talk about um, and uh, I'll mention it in a minute <laughs> getting back to the uh, the blurb um, so uh, yes uh, privileges of membership include the right to borrow books periodicals and other publications from the society's extensive library located at the Melbourne Observatory which was also open for the first time in the same extraordinary amount of time so uh, yes, the ASV Library, which is a, uh, an extensive library, has uh, hundreds of copies of uh, books and magazines and videos and uh, uh, all, uh, all sorts of things of astronomical bent. Uh, it's a great place. I haven't been there for ages, so uh, uh, <laughs> it's a great place to, uh, to stick your nose in through the door. Always get bowled over by the smell of aging books. Um, Anyway, the uh, right. So periodicals and other publications. Yes, the Melbourne Observatory uh, receipt of the ASV newsletter crux, and containing articles and news, observing notes, and the like, and the free provision of the astronomical yearbook, which is this thing I'm holding here. It's the yearbook which the ASV publishes every year. It's kind of an almanac um, for astronomical uh, observations and things. Uh, so, uh, the yearbook provides data for local observations, informative summaries of various celestial objects and other general astronomical information. Access is available to telescopes on members' nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory. Uh, the instruments located there include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector. There's also a 300mm portable reflector. And there's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and a photoheliograph are also housed and uh, 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 ex uh, members have access to these telescopes too. Uh, regular society club night meetings are held on the first and last Fridays of each month at the society's property located in Burwood. Uh, members are encouraged to use the society's instruments located there in order to gain first-hand experience in telescope use. The instruments located there are a 508 millimeter equatorial reflector and a bunch of smaller telescopes. Members are also encouraged. Uh, members are also encouraged to make uh, use of telescopes, or so make use of the society's country property located near Heathcote, some 90-minute drive north of Melbourne. The Leon Mao Dark Sky Site (LMDSS) offers superb views away from the light polluted city of Melbourne, and is an ideal spot for visual observing and astrophotography and a little bit of radio astronomy. Members are also encouraged to make use of telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. In fact, there's, uh -huh, there's uh, 20 sections that make up the ASV. And if I can just get to the right mouse. Uh, ooh, blinded by this bright screen. Um, let me just go through the uh, 20 sections. <clears throat> uh, we have astro in alphabetical order, we have astrophotography, probably the biggest section out of them all. Uh, Bendigo section, the club section, the comet section, computing section, cosmology and astrophysics, deep sky, demonstrator section, 
diurnals, which I think still they're still looking for a section director to replace Pat. Uh, Great Melbourne Telescope section, historical section, instrument making, juniors, lunar and planetary, meteor section, new astronomers group, outdoor lightning improvement, radio astronomy, solar and space exploration section. So uh, all those sections have individual pages that can be opened up for uh, uh, additional information. And um, if you uh, th think any of those sections of, of any value, of any interest, by all means, get in contact with the section director. Um, and uh, they will organize for you to come along to a meeting, whether it be by Zoom or at the actual club room. I suspect that uh, meetings at the club room in Burwood will uh, kick off uh, next year. Um, so uh, we'll keep you informed of how things are going in that area too. Uh, Alright, so uh, that's all those sections can be viewed from the ASV website without a problem -o. Uh Okay, so, uh, or otherwise you can write, send a letter, if you prefer writing a letter and using a, a pen, you remember a pen, the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. And, uh, uh, but like I say, the, uh, the uh, website uh, has um, more ex extensive information available. And uh, you can find all the uh, information that you need from the website at www.asv.org.au. And uh, we're kind of currently looking at the homepage of the ASV as we speak. And uh, uh, like I say, tomorrow is the Starbuck queue. Um, I suspect there are still some tickets available. You have to order a ticket online to be able to gain access to the site. Uh, there, there's the old double vax check. And, um, and of course, to confirm that you've got the ticket as well, which I think is five dollars, something like that. Anyway, uh, so that can be all gleamed from the homepage of the ASV. Um, but uh, at this stage, I'm not really sure how many uh, how many tickets have been sold. Uh, so, but it should be a, a good day up there tomorrow anyway. Uh, um, 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 where was I heading to from here? Um, oh yes. Um, just a quick thing, where is it, where was it, calendar, yeah, so last Wednesday we had a, um, um, we had uh, a talk uh, from um, Sarah Webb, uh, the speaker was Sarah Webb from Swinburne University, and uh, she was talking about um, machine learning in astronomy and using it to find fast flaring stars, so for about 30 minutes. So I figure she had about 30 minutes to do a presentation and she zipped along at a great rate of knots and had some fantastic uh, slides that she showed. And uh, I believe the uh, last Wednesday's uh, monthly meeting is available to view uh, on the YouTube or Fox Facebook uh, website. Uh, so uh, I think it's available. I haven't double checked that but um, I think if you go to the ASV website or not the um, the YouTube one, the YouTube ASC website, you'll find uh, uh, the replay of last Wednesday's uh, meeting. So uh, you can still catch up with it. <laughs> anyway, thanks to Sarah Webb for coming along to our uh, first uh, of uh, the uh, um, last of the meetings for this year anyway. <laughs> so it's funny how it's, how it's worked out, it really is. Okay, uh, alright, now, uh, what time is it? 10.15, just looking at um, the sky notes from, um, from Tanya Hill, I think, from the planetarium, and uh, just very briefly, I'll run through the, the planet lineup again for this month. Uh, Mercury is not visible this month, being too close to the sun. Uh, Venus. Now, Venus is an amazing planet to look at at the moment. Uh, I was actually quite dumbfounded, uh, gobsmacked, um, and bowled over uh, uh, by the brightness of Venus last Wednesday night. I was taking out the rubbish. It was still a bit twilighty in the sky, and uh, there was an exceptionally bright object in the sky. There was a near new moon uh, in the sky as well, and Saturn above. 
but uh, this exceptionally bright object, I, um, I was blinking my eyes several times trying to clear up the image, but it was Venus. It was Venus there in the afternoon or evening sky, and it was so bright. I've, I just don't think I've ever seen it that bright before. It was really, I think I could have, it could have cast a shadow uh, on the, my hand. It was that bright, really beautiful. Uh, so Venus has been the evening star in the west during the last few months and will continue to be visible into December from 9pm setting before midnight. However, each evening it will become visible progressively lower in the west until the end of the month it will become lost in the dusk of the evening. Uh, it will then take a pass behind the sun to reappear, reappear in late January as the morning star. Mars has now completed its pass behind the sun, but it's too close to be visible this month. For Jupiter, uh, Jupiter is the third brightest object in the night sky after the Moon and Venus and will be visible in the northwest from just after 9pm or just before 9pm in the fading twilight before setting at around 1am uh, early in the month. By mid-month it will set around midnight and by the month's end it will be setting around 11.30 in the evening. Saturn remains easy to spot uh, between Venus low in the west and Jupiter high up in the northwest. In the early December it will appear in the twilight shortly after Jupiter and lead Jupiter towards the horizon by midnight. The yellow tinged second largest planet will set earlier each night until by the end of the month it will be gone by 10.45. Now, what we've been taking uh, uh, fun at looking at uh, in the last few days as well is a triple lineup: Venus, Saturn, Jupiter. <clears throat> uh, as was the case in November, three of the five visible planets will continue to appear in an impressive line in the western evening sky. They will be in Sagittarius, Capricornus and Aquarius and Venus low in the west, Saturn midway and Jupiter high in the northwest. A bonus addition to the lineup this month will be the Moon. From the 10th it will be to the right of Jupiter in the west as a crescent moon reaching first quarter, uh, first quarter um, uh, by the 11th. Each night after that it will further be further to the north as it transitions to a full moon in the east on the 19th. Over a week or so, you can both enjoy the planetary lineup and observe our lunar neighbour how it changes its phases. So, uh, yeah, it's quite something to see at the moment. Meteors. This month, it's time for the Geminids, which peak on the night of the 13th and the 14th. They are a consistent source of meteors and appear in Gemini in the northeast with bright star Castor. Most meteor showers result from Earth passing through the debris trail of past comets, but the Geminids are associated with an asteroid Pathion, I think that's how you pronounce that, which orbits the Sun every 1.4 years in an hour in, in an hour in good viewing conditions you can expect to see 40 to 120 meteors. A handy visual guide for meteor showers has been produced by um, Parveen Servanjewski. Uh, although created this year, all details will remain the same for 2022 except for moon phases. This is something you have to see on the uh, planetarium website, so I won't go any further into that because there's a chart that he's created. Um, so it's just a, a meteor shower calendar for 2021 and it kind of just indicates when the meteors were, what's the likely uh, shower content and what the phases of the moon will be. So it's an interesting little calendar. Uh, but uh, you, yes, you have to go to ScienceWorks uh, to uh, we'll look up Sky Notes for, for December to see that. Uh, okay, um, time is 10.20. Got to keep an eye on that time. Stars and constellations. Uh, across the entire eastern sky this month, ranging from the northeast to the southeast, we have a rich night sky to enjoy. So this is something we're all going to be seeing tomorrow night up at the dark sky side. Uh, although from a southern hemisphere perspective, some constellations will be inverted. It's a fact of life living on a globe that when you move far enough north or south of the equator, a star pattern ends up appearing upside down. 
it is for the same reason that the face of the moon is upside down viewed from one hemisphere compared to the other. Directly east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky and principal star in the constellation of Kansas Major. One of the two companions of the hunter Orion, who is in the northeast. Look for the three bright stars in a row and you've located his belt. In, the, in our southern view, uh, they are... Uh, let's use funny words here. Anyway, in, I'll do it this way. In our southern view, they are lower left and centre and upper right. There you go. Uh, <laughs> they just threw in some Latin words there, which I just wasn't going to try. Um, hanging off this belt is the scabbard, or sword, which runs to the upper right and which contains a fuzzy star, which in reality is the beautiful Orion Nebula. Not quite a fuzzy star. And stellar nursery of gas and star formation 1500 light years away, lit by the young hot star's deep interior. Uh, that's what you can see. And um, low right, lower in the right, is the Orion, uh, in Orion is the red giant star Betelgeuse, which is one of the of his shoulders. Uh, while human eyesight is not good enough to detect the colour at uh, a low light levels, such as night, this star is one of the several that emit enough red light that we can uh, easily notice. To the left and to the a little to the higher is Beltrix, and um, this uh, is the this makes up the shoulder or armpit of Orion. Uh, by contrast, at the upper left is the bright blue giant star Regal, which makes up one of Orion's feet, and the other being Sif, a less bright star, a little lower to the right. Sif, Sif, I think it's how you pronounce that. Uh, in the north, we got uh, Orion. Is is uh, north of Orion is Taurus the Bull, uh, with another bright star. Red is Aldebaran, making marking the bull's red eye. A little to the right is the beautiful Pallades star cluster of seven, or seven sisters, um, also very similar to the uh, Superu uh, uh, lineup of stars you often see in the emblem on Superu cars. Found that out today. Um, <laughs> G'day Mark, if you're listening. See below for a photo of this iconic world-famous feature of the night sky. It seems all the cultures have given it a significant place in stories and lore and on the back of cars. <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to jump through a few things here. In fact, because um, there's a lot here to mention. Um, yeah, all right. If you're looking out for the International Space Station, uh, there's a passing in the evening. Actually, no, the morning we can do it because it's still the dates are still fresh. Uh, there's a passing of the International Space Station on the morning of Wednesday, the 15th, um, kicking off at 4:55 a.m., finishing at 5:01, coming in from the west southwest to the north northeast. Then on Thursday, the 16th, it's, there's a 4:07 passing coming in from the southwest to the northeast. Then on the evening of the 12th of Sunday, Sunday the 12th, there's a passing at 10.21 p.m. coming in from the northwest to the southeast. On Thursday the 30th, there's a passing that starts at 10.46 p.m. west-southwest to the north-northeast. And, uh, and finally on Friday the 31st of December, just after Christmas, there's a passing at 9.58 p.m coming in from the southwest to the northeast. So there's a plenty of chance there to see the International Space Station if you haven't had a chance to see that yet. Conversely, you can always go to Heavens Above website for details on when to see these objects in the sky. Heavens Above is quite an extensive uh, website. And uh, if you put your own location, latitude and longitude in, you'll get an accurate uh, prediction of when, well, not so much a prediction, it's a, pretty accurate of when these passings will occur, uh, not only just for the International Space Station, but just about ever, ever, uh, every other object that's uh, viewable in the sky. Alright, this is VK3 EKH, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. We say a very pleasant good evening to, uh, or oh, somebody's waving, I'm not sure who it is, but uh, I'm just checking on the chat window there. Not many people on the chat window. Where are you guys? <laughs> um, 
Oh, yeah. G'day to Dom and Dave uh, that's tuned into VK2ELS and VK3HDX. They've sent a, an email there too. All right, uh, let me see, just to read out a few dates. Uh, on the 10th of December 1993, the faulty optics of the Hubble Space Telescope were, were repaired. 1993. On the 11th of December 1863, uh, you had the birth of astronomer Annie Jump Cannon, compiler of Draper Star Catalogue. 1863. On the 12th of um, December 1970, Explorer 42 from the USA satellite is launched to study X-rays. On the 14th of December 1546, uh, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, uh, whose data aided Kepler in his laws of planetary motion, was born. And also on the 14th of December 1962, Mariner 2 is the first probe to fly past Venus. And one more date, on the 15th of December 1970, uh, Verona 7 USSR is the first probe to land safely on another planet and first to return data when it arrived at Venus. Yes, Russians have had a, a fairly strong interest with Venus <laughs> over the years. Anyway, there's plenty more dates there, but I'll get back to them a little later on. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, broadcasting from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Now I shall come up with the uh, podcast interview with Mr. Robert Arrowsmith, current section director for radio astronomy at the ASV. G'day, Rob, if you are listening. Uh, let's just hope I get this all queued up and it's good to go. <laughs> so let me see if this is all good to go. Um, I'm going to have to do this as well. And that's there and that should be... Hello Robert. Hello Brendan. It's a pleasure today to be speaking again with Robert Arrowsmith. Robert was our first featured guest almost exactly 12 months ago in episode one of Astrophys, where he told us of his early visits to the Parks Dish and his subsequent work in Linux computing. He is one of the leaders in the radio astronomy arm of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. And in episode one, he described the work being done at the ASV Leon Mo Radio Observatory, which is located in a RF quiet zone about 90 minutes north of Melbourne in southeast Australia at a place called Heathcote. Now, Robert, we know that citizen science is going ahead in leaps and bounds, and organisations like the ASV are fueling the fire. So before we get into the technical aspects of all the things happening up on your radio observatory site at Heathcote, can you give us a broad outline of the various activities driven by the ASV? Astrophotography is only one example. You know, Brendan, as a member of the Astronomical Society of Victoria and the ASV website editor, I get to see some of the fantastic things the society gets involved in. The restoration of the Great Melbourne Telescope, management of the Melbourne Observatory and the Royal Botanic Gardens, classes for members in construction of telescopes, purchase of a new solar telescope, and of course, ongoing development in our dark sky site in central Victoria. There are two weekend events in March and September that attract over 100 members, and of course, our Christmas barbecue in December that's open to the public. Okay, great. From a practical science point of view, our members regularly produce some great astronomy. We've had members' photography featured on the NASA Astronomy Picture of the Day website, as well as Discovery of Asteroids. Fantastic. Now, at this time last year, you told us about some of your ongoing projects at the observatory and also some of your long-term projects. Can you give us an update on your enduring projects, Robert? Yeah, our focus over the last few years has been the building of our 8-metre radio astronomy dish. For a long time, we were delayed by local government dragging their heels with approval of building plans. Several other projects at our dark sky site were intertwined with approvals, so it greatly affected our progress. 
In April this year, we finally poured about 20 cubic metres of concrete for our dish foundation and we're extremely happy with the result. My own project is the Low Frequency Array, designed to explore the low VHF frequencies between 20 to 50 megahertz. Some of the science there should let us look at atmospheric physics, ionisation of the Earth's atmosphere, mapping of the sky, and reception of pulsar emissions with extreme dispersion characteristics. Right. One of our members is building a magnetometer and another member is completing an ultra-low frequency receiver designed to receive atmospheric emissions around a few hundred hertz. Electromagnetic waves produced by lightning strikes can travel around the world and sound like a whistle. This will be a fascinating project and we plan to have the audio from the receiver available through a digital stream on the internet. Fantastic. Thanks, Robert. Now, I've been following your progress and project development of the 8-metre dish on social media. And now, can you tell us about this 8-metre project and its associated instruments that you've been working on this year? Once construction of the dish is complete, we hope to produce some great science. Reception of pulsars, mapping of hydrogen line emissions at 1.4 gigahertz, measuring the rotation of our galaxy by observing the Doppler effect and maybe even reception of telemetry from various robotic space missions. Oh, look, there's nothing like hacking spacecraft, Robert. That that sounds fabulous. Now, some great projects there, and the foundations are laid and the cabling's all ready. Can you tell us about the command and control systems that will drive this antenna? Yeah, sure. We have some design issues we're trying to overcome at the moment. One of the problems is the limited electrical power available to us. At the start, we knew there was going to be trouble when our air conditioner kept tripping the main circuit breaker, which, as it turned out, also caused by moisture building up in some of the extensive power networks. Yep. At the moment, we're limited to about 10 amps on our single-phase power circuit. We're looking at using the limited power supply to charge a battery bank and supplement it with solar panels. Oh, yeah. It appears that our power usage will have intermittent peaks, which we can smooth out with the battery storage and inverter system. Yep. We're in a motor drive selection phase at the moment. We've got quotes from suppliers, including gearboxes and drive circuitry. There was some talk of running at 600 volts, but this might prove to be a bit of a challenge for us. <laughs> yep. The plan is to use a software package called Radio Eyes that is available through radiosky.com. This package works in two parts. The visual part of the software gives a graphical view of the sky and uses a database with locations of sky objects. A point in the sky can be selected for tracking of an object and the tracking position is passed through the internet to the management module that executes commands to a hardware box connected to the motors and positioning sensors. Amazing. Users can then use the graphical interface to make a task list, upload the list to the management module, and automatically point the dish at the required time. Yep. Of course, the other important job is to manage the receiver hardware selecting frequencies, starting and stopping reception of signals, and recording information in different mediums. One of our receivers will be using a software-defined receiver that outputs a stream of data that can be recorded to a computer and analysed at a later date. Typically, the data could also be reduced using fast Fourier transforms that convert from time to frequency, giving a spectrum analysis output. Okay, let's wind up our propeller heads a little bit further then, Robert, and tell our listeners about the instruments that will be connected to this dish. The dish itself has some impressive characteristics, apart from being 8 metres across. It should be quite usable up to 5 gigahertz without too much loss. Yep. Being a mesh dish, its performance is limited by the size of the mesh holes. Yep. As the wavelength of signals gets smaller, you lose signal through the mesh. Yep. That said, it will have good gain at 400 megahertz, which is a radio astronomy allocated frequency for pulsar reception. Okay. So we plan for two converters to be used, one to down convert from 400 megahertz to an intermediate frequency, probably 10 megahertz or 70 megahertz, and another from 14, 20 megahertz to our intermediate frequency. Okay, yep. We will have coaxial cable carrying the intermediate frequency signals from the converters at the dish into our laboratory. 
That's fabulous. Now, once this dish is commissioned, what will be some of the initial targets you'll go for and how will you be allocating time for researchers? Commissioning the system, or as they say, first light, will probably consist of performing sun tracking. We should get some good indications from observed signals as to how it tracks by looking for peaking or dipping in levels. Once we've ironed out the bugs with the tracking system, we can move on to fine tuning the software for remote control. Okay. Yep. I envisage a manual control panel in our laboratory giving us the ability to directly point the dish and of course the all important red switch in <laughs> case something goes yeah. wrong. Yep. As I mentioned earlier, by using the radioized software, we can upload task lists to the telescope. Oh, yeah. For the foreseeable future, we will take requests from researchers and manage the observing events ourselves. Yep. In the future, we may implement a system similar to the CSIRO ATNF remote access. Yep. We would then become a more mainstream service with a familiar interface. Fantastic. Now, at the Leon Mo Radio Observatory, you have eight instruments streaming live real-time science data to the internet for anyone to have a look at and download. You've got a magnetometer, you've got a gamma ray detector, all sky camera and a radio Jove receiver and several others. That's fantastic, Robert. Brendan, a lot of our projects at the observatory were out-of-the-box projects where available software and hardware could easily be set up on computers and the output of these projects could result in graphical data or just JPEG images. Yep. This meant we could simply upload files to the website and display the images on the web pages. Yep. In the case of the weather station, all the weather information was output as JPEGs and also a numerical text file with the last 30 days weather. Yep. We've tried to keep that plan as it makes the whole process a lot simpler. And great to introduce people to some wonderful science. Now, it would be a good time now to tell listeners how they can see some of this data. Just go to tinyearl.com forward slash leonmo17, L-E-O-N-M-O-W-17, or lowercase. Now, tell us about your work on the ASV website, please, Rob. Yeah, sure, Brendan. When I started the website for the radio astronomy section over five years ago, we had our own website apart from the ASV. Yep. This made sense at the time since I didn't have access to the main ASV website. I took over managing the ASV website 18 months ago, and one of the first things I did was to move the radio astronomy website into the ASV website. Yep. Some new features were added during the move, and overall, I'm really pleased with the outcome. The Leon Mao Radio Observatory web pages are under the About Us menu tab on the ASV website, or just go to asv.org.au slash lmro underscore home. Excellent. Now, will this 8-metre dish also stream to the web? Brendan, in some respects, we'll be able to make remote access to the dish available. I hope to have real-time spectrum data at 1.4 gigahertz available. We may just leave the dish pointed in one position, called a drift scan, yep. and as the sky moves across, the output of the receiver will display on the website using some clever Java software. Yeah, great. I'm a big believer in giving people some exciting things to see on the website. And that's certainly the case. And now listeners might better understand as a result of this, Robert, how citizen science is really accelerating. Now, the microphone is all yours, Rob, and we invite you to give us your favourite rant or rave about astronomy or science or outreach or education. It's all yours. Thanks, Brendan. Well, I guess my biggest disappointment is in the amount of money that's been made available to the sciences in Australia. Yep. As we all know, the CSIRO had its funding cut severely. We've had events like the Parks Radio Telescope Visitors Day cancelled because they were lacking funds. I think what we need in Australia is a much bigger focus on especially science in schools. I note that recently Year 7 students in Victoria are now going into astronomy. 
the state government has put astronomy onto the curriculum for Year 7. So the ASV has actually been holding some astronomy nights at schools around Melbourne. So it's great to see that we're getting out there with telescopes and showing kids what's up in the night sky. Because to tell you the truth, Brendan, most people out there have never even seen a planet through a telescope before. For instance, we've had some fantastic events at ScienceWorks where we've had the Astronomy and Light Festival and there's one coming up again later this year, which is well worth looking at. Yep. And at those sort of events, the ASV members come along with their telescopes and set them up for people to actually view the night sky through. And last year at the Astronomy and Light Festival, we had over 1,200 people attend the night. Fantastic. I know. <laughs> So I guess, Brendan, we need to see a lot more science in schools, not specifically astronomy, but it's great to see that it's it's now becoming part of the curriculum. I personally love science and astronomy and, of course, radio. I'm an amateur radio operator as well, so being a ham radio operator, I get to play with radio at the same time as playing with astronomy when I'm up at Teethgate. <laughs> and that's where radio astronomy started, Rob. Well, that's fantastic, Rob. It's wonderful the work that you and the ASV are doing to get those young people involved in science and specifically involved in astronomy. It's fantastic. Thanks, Brendan. I really appreciate your supporting us on your show. I hope that in the future we have a really fantastic radio astronomy site at Heathcote that people can come and visit and, and actually see what we do up there. Well, thank you very much, Rob. It's been fantastic speaking with you again. Thanks, Brendan. It's been really good to catch up with you and I have really enjoyed our conversation. That was Rob. Okay. Excellent. And uh, why can't I hear myself? One, two, one, two, one, two. Yep, I am definitely there. Um, okay. This is VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. And uh, I think there's uh, headphones. The level in the headphones just doesn't sound loud enough, but I'll take them off because they're a bit distracting. Anyway, thanks, uh, Brendan, for uh, the um, uh, getting access to your uh, astrophys uh, casts. And uh, even though that recording was uh, done about four years ago, I think, uh, four or maybe five years ago now, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a lot of things that Rob uh, makes reference to in his interview just then, of course, have uh, uh, come into uh, fruition more ways than one. And, uh, and of course, uh, but we still have uh, uh, a few little uh, bugs in the system which we, we are ironing out. And um, not to mention that the COVID uh, virus situation has uh, stopped us from doing a, a lot of things up there. Um, <coughs> everything's been pretty much put on hold for uh, 18 months uh, with restrictions to travel. So uh, it has put a, a pause on things, but I know that the uh, the guys uh, that are up there, we've got uh, some very very great uh, good heads up there that are engineering minded, and um, they're uh, constantly now working on getting the, the dish doing things and getting some of the other projects that have been there since day one, actually uh, back up and running. So Rob, uh, Rob is no longer the webmaster for the ASV website. Rob's moved on, and uh, uh, so he's now looking after two sections of the ASV. Uh, Rob's taken over the section director role, which is what uh, I was doing for 12 years, and um, he's also looking after a new section, which is the space exploration section, which meets on a Thursday uh, evening. And um, uh, so he's got two caps there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I hope to be up at uh, the Dark Sky site tomorrow. Uh, sometime in the afternoon I'll, I shall hopefully get up there if my Subaru makes it all the way and doesn't overheat. And uh, I'll get a chance to see the dish and uh, a few other people I haven't seen for a long, long time up there. So um, it should be a good night. But nevertheless, uh, thanks Rob for that. And um, uh, yeah, there it is. 
You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria. Pleasant good evening to Andrew, VK3 KIS. He's sent us an email. And uh, Dave, VK2 ELS, has also posted a picture of the YouTube, well, <laughs> a fixed image from the YouTube feed onto the chat window there so I can see myself looking back at me. Marvellous. Many years ago, when I started uh, doing the ASV broadcast, taking over from Russell Ward, VK3DRW, uh, for those that might remember that Russell uh, kicked off the, the ASV broadcast from 1988. Uh, the ASV broadcast has been a, a regular Friday night uh, uh, cast on these frequencies. And um, anyway, what I'm getting to, um, in those early days, when I started to do the uh, broadcast myself, um, the Green Guide uh, used to publish um, a, uh, a, an astronomical uh, story um, in the Green Guide by Perry Vlahos, and uh, I used to always start off the ASV broadcast um, every, um, every Friday night with the, the latest Green Guide uh, write-up that Perry would write for the, uh, for the Green Guide. Now, it was really, really fantastic having those articles uh, that uh, Perry would spend some time writing. And um, there was one article, though, that was very popular. Um, I, I always got uh, a feedback uh, uh, from Perry's article on how to, uh, to buy your first telescope. So given that we've got the star barbecue happening tomorrow, there might be uh, some folks that are listening wondering what... Uh, what steps should they, they take to uh, to buying a, uh, a telescope for the first time? So I've managed to find the article um, that Perry wrote for the Green Guide. Um, I don't know what date it was, but uh, this is the article anyway that Perry wrote about buying your first telescope, if you've ever been thinking about it. So Perry writes that the question that seems to crop up most often at a party when, when people find out uh, that I'm a, an astronomer uh, after they, they've asked if we are alone in the universe uh, is what type of telescope they should buy for themselves as a gift for a loved one. So as Christmas is approaching fast we have, uh, let me save you from buying a turkey a, a good, a great for the dinner but you know not so much for astronomy. The best advice I can give you before shooting down to your local department store with credit card in hand is don't go there. Buy a telescope. Sorry, buy it. Yeah, that's right. Buy a telescope from a telescope shop. In my experience, Perry that is, uh, and though I have not tested out all department stores, I have found in the main that the sales staff know little about telescopes and make some impossible claims about the instruments on hand. Furthermore, very few of them ever have ever looked through one at the night sky. Next bit of advice is that if a telescope is being advertised on the strength of its powers of magnification, such as magnifies by X600, don't just walk away from the telescope, but run. Strange as it may seem, Perry says, the real power of a telescope does not lie in its magnification, but rather the diameter of its objective lens or mirror. Astronomers refer to it as the aperture. In other words, the large main mirror at the bottom of the tube. Hang on, I just skipped a line there. Uh, where was it? Sorry, I just skipped a line because I blinked. <laughs> Strange as it may seem, the real power of a telescope does not lie in the magnification, but rather... Whoops. Computer's gone to sleep on me now. Hang up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Be a nice computer. Right in the middle of the stream, because I haven't got power on the, the laptop, so I'm running it off batteries. So <laughs> it's deciding to go to sleep on me, bloody thing. Back to the sentence. Strange as it may seem, the real power of a telescope does not lie in its magnification, but rather the diameter of its objective lens or mirror. Astronomers refer to it as the aperture. In other words, the larger the main mirror at the bottom of the tube, if it is a reflector or lens at the front of the tube, if it is a re refractor, the, the, the better of the instrument, he says. Good scopes are advertised by the size of the objective's aperture, such as a 10-inch 
F5 Dobsonian reflector. You can easily change eyepieces for more or less magnification, but you can't change mirror or lenses. They, they're in the scope forever, he says. A telescope needs a mounting to hold it steady and it is essentially its essential consideration in such a purchase. As such, you'll read or hear the word equatorial a lot. Uh, many will say it is the best one to have because it will track the stars and it will have coordinates etched into it for finding objects so that it can be used like a Melways of the sky, he says. Avoid equatorials with a passion if you are purchasing your first telescope. Unless you are planning on spending thousands of dollars on the best example of this type of mount, then don't waste your time and money. They will be counterintuitive and confuse you at the best. At worst, uh, we'll see you using swear words that you would make even me blush. Cheap equatorial telescopes on flimsy tripods end up sitting in dark closets attracting dust and come out once a year to scare little children into eating their vegetables. So, let's cut to the chase, Perry says. Uh, then and see the what the recommendation is. <clears throat> These days you can buy a good telescope for a fraction of the money required only 25 years ago. It is a golden age of astronomy. Go to a telescope shop or even search the net for an 8 inch f6 reflector telescope on a Dobsonian mount. It will be quick to set up, easy to use and move about with your fingertips to the dark sky, to a dark sky. You will get good views of the moons of Jupiter, rings of Saturn, find close-up views of the craters of the moon, see beautiful clusters of stars, and from the uh, from a dark sky, uh, we'll show you the nebula of galaxies. It should cost you between four hundred and fifty to six hundred and fifty dollars, and that's a bargain. So do not spend any more, no matter the bells and whistles promised. If you can't afford that much then wait until you can, and uh, uh, else you'll be disappointed. So that's Perry's recommendation for, uh, for buying a telescope. And uh, like I say, that used to be in the Green Guide. Uh, 2009, there it is. Um, he published that, 2009, uh, in the Green Guide. So on a Thursday afternoon, Thursday, whatever. So I miss uh, I miss those articles. Uh, they were uh, exceptionally uh, good to uh, to read out. So uh, uh, thanks, Perry, for all that. And um, oh, <laughs> which re reminds me, uh, I can't remember what the expression was now. Something about cat's tails and comets. We've we've got a, a comet uh, that's due to make a, an appearance in the sky here in the southern hemisphere. Uh, I I don't have exact information on it right now. Um, yeah, I'll let you know next week <laughs> what, uh, what's happening. But there is a comet um, which could, uh, I've heard, could potentially break up into fragments. But um, uh, at the moment, it's uh, it should be visible by the naked eye in a very faint, in, in a good sky viewing conditions. And uh, it's not quite viewable yet here in the Melbourne Victorian skies, but it will be very soon. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so there was a bit of talk about that. Uh, in fact, Perry mentioned it uh, at the end of the meeting on Wednesday night. Uh, okay, so now this is VK3EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, ASV Radio. Okay, oh, blinded by the brightness of the screen. Um, let me see, let me see. We're coming up to the last five minutes. Again, I had multiple articles here ready to go, uh, but there was something here. Um, have I mentioned this? I can't remember if I mentioned this last week or not. Um, uh, if time stops for an object falling into a black hole, how can LIGO see black holes colliding, is the question. That's the question. If time stops for an object falling into a black hole, how can LIGO see black holes colliding? And the response to that is that um, uh, uh, let's consider GW150914, the first binary black hole merger detected via gravitational waves. The final black hole formed 
during the merger is 60 times the mass of the Sun, which means that its size is about 124 miles or 200 kilometers across. This is the typical size of the remnants from black hole mergers that we observe through gravitational waves with Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory or LIGO. Now, how is a pulse of light sent by someone falling into a black hole different from the gravitational waves emitted during a merger? Optical light has a wavelength, the distance between two crests of a, of a light wave or about 1000 nanometers. For someone falling into the black hole and sending out a pulse of light, the light will be emitted from some location close to the event horizon or point of no return. Gravitational waves on the other hand cannot be traced to a specific origin in the region of space-time around black holes. This makes more sense when we look at our example signal. The waves produced during GW150914 have a wavelength of 3000 kilometers, which is larger than the size of the system. In other words, the main difference between gravitational waves and pulses of light is that the former can be thought of being emitted from the entire dynamical vibrating space-time around the merger of two black holes. They do not correspond to any particular location such as the black hole event horizons where gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. So there's your answer I guess to that. <laughs> I just read it because it was a short article to read. Uh, all right now and one other little thing here which I've been holding on to um, another question sort of thing are meteorites radioactive? Do meteorites emit a high degree of radiation when they fall to Earth? Should precautions be taken when handling them? Asks Wade Carmen of Cleveland, Tennessee. On average, around 500 meteorites fall to Earth each year. Any radioactive elements contained in a meteorite are no more significant than an ordinary terrestrial rock. Although meteorites aren't harmful to humans, we can actually be pretty harmful to them. Our hands are covered in oils and microbes, both of which can contaminate the meteorite and degrade its surface. Whether you are actively looking for meteorites or happen to upon one, uh, you should handle it with care. You can pick it up with clean gloves, tongs or even aluminium foil. Once you've collected your space rock, keep it clean and, dry, and in a, keep it in a clean and dry place. A zip close bag is a perfect way to protect it from humi humidity. Uh, that said, it can be a bit tacky to know if you're actually found a meteorite. Oh, sorry, tricky. The word was tricky, not tacky. <laughs> I thought that sounded strange. Uh, that said, it can be a bit tricky to know whether you've actually found a meteorite. You can ask yourself a few simple questions to determine whether you found a meteorite or a meteor wrong. That's a play on the words there. Uh, one, is the specimen black or brown and smooth with no holes, bubbles on the surface? Is the specimen solid and compact? Is the specimen heavy compared to normal rocks on the same size? Is the specimen entirely made of metal or does it show metallic specks or parts of a broken cut or polished surface? If you've answered yes to all these questions and are interested in learning more about your sample, you should contact your local geological survey office, university, geological department or natural history museum for help identifying your specimen. Yep, so there you go. All right, I yet to find a meteor, but uh, meteorite on the ground, but there it is. But they're actually they're showing a picture here um, of two uh, researchers actually Find, they've actually found a meteorite sitting on the, the surface of snow up in Antarctica. Uh, it says here, scientists with Antarctica Search for Meteorites program collected a meteorite in Antarctica's Miller, Miller Range. And there's a picture of them right down on the surface of the, uh, the ice. And the, the, meteor, the meteorite is just sitting there on the ice. It's <laughs> amazing. Amazing grace, we say. Alright, let's get across to spaceweather.com. Uh, 
Uh, okay, a bit of refresh the page to make sure that I've got the right date here. Yep, I have. All right. Uh, the solar wind is currently at 314.5 kilometers a second at a density of 17.7 .7 protons per cubic centimetre. There are no sunspots on the disk of the sun. The sun is currently spotless. Uh, so when we put it, when the uh, telescope comes out tomorrow, uh, the special, special helio uh, telescope, I think there's a name for it, but anyway, uh, comes out to look at the sun tomorrow, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to see any sunspots unless one suddenly appears. The radio sun is currently at 77 solar flux units measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimetres. There's a picture of this comet here, by the way, uh, on this uh, this today's uh, spaceweather.com report. Uh, firstly, they say here that a, a solar storm will barely miss Earth. On the 5th of December, a magnetic filament in the sun's southern hemisphere exploded. The swirling debris will probably sail just south of our planet in on December 10 and 11. Uh, no geomagnetic storms are expected, uh, but the near miss should spark auroras around the poles. Comet Leonid update. The com Comet Leonid C-2021A3 uh, C C is approaching Earth for a close encounter 35 million kilometres away on the 12th of December. Uh, since Monday, the comet has nearly tripled its brightness, now magnitude plus 5, making it an easy target for backyard telescopes. Amateur astronomer Michael de Jager, or J Jager uh, sends this picture from someplace in Austria, and uh, it's quite a beautiful picture. The tail uh, is currently 10 degrees long. Uh, it's got a very distinctive greeny-blue glow about it. Um, like I say, this comet is making its way to uh, our skies in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that. Um, meanwhile, um, as of the 10th of December 2021, there has been 2,242 potentially hazardous asteroids, which we're all tracking and keeping an eye on, as far as I know. That's it from spaceweather.com, and uh, we'll leave it at that, I think. But that Comet Leonard is, is looking really, really interesting. If I had, been, had a time to get ready, I would have uh, got a picture of that so I could show you on YouTube and uh, whatnot. Nevertheless, all right, this has uh, been a, uh, uh, um, a broadcast from the uh, from VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. Concluding transmissions tonight, um, I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, sent me emails, uh, David uh, uh, VK2ELS and Don VK3HDX, uh, Ian VK3VIM and Andrew VK3KIS and also we have Joe who's come up on the chat window, g'day Joe, uh, Dave again, uh, Mr. 2ELS and uh, up there is Cassiopeia uh, who says I oh, will be at the Star BQ. Yeah, that'll be great. Come across, Cassiopeia. It'd be nice to meet you. Um, put a face to the Cassiopeia up there on the on the uh, the chat window. So I just hope I hope I'm up there um, for tomorrow. I've got my ticket. Spent my dollars on the ticket and um, and all the rest. So I should be able to sail in without a problem. So this is VK3 EKH uh, concluding transmissions on 1865. Our simulcast frequency and uh, we'll take a call back on 80 meters so stand by stations on 80 meters on 3541 kilohertz so this is VK3 EKH more information about the Astronomical Society of Victoria can be found at www.asv.org.au it's all happening on that web page this is VK3 EKH, concluding transmissions on 1865. Cheers everyone that's listening there, and uh, we'll see you next week. Alright, now, for stations on 80 metres, stand by. Just getting my pen ready here, and uh, don't all speak at once. <laughs> this is VK3 EKH, listening on 3541. VK3 Tango Julius Sierra.
Okay, we've got VK3VIN, VK3TJS, and VK2ELS. Any other stations uh, we should check in? Uh, VK3HDX. VK3 no worries, VK3HDX and VK3C8H check in only. Anybody else? VK3EKH. I can hear the woodpecker check going in the background there over the horizon radar. It's a bit of a, a hassle. Uh, anyway, VK3VIN, VK3EKH, have a say in. Yeah, it's very rare that that's uh, over the horizon radar, radar comes down this far as Question, uh, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, I wondered if, whether you are aware if there are more solar flares around given the um, rather crazy nature of the conditions. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, uh, there are signals are way, way down and it sounds like they're muffled over. Uh, right, VK3 VIN, VK3 EKH returning. Yeah, look, I. I um, because I look at the spaceweather.com site almost daily uh, and uh, also uh, I get uh, emails from the space weather woman uh, from uh, Tamitha. Tam Tamitha is actually pretty quick to, to let um, her patrons uh, know uh, whether the sun is uh, arcing up and uh, making uh, various potential uh, flares and, and disturbances. So at this stage, uh, there's, it's been pretty quiet um, this last few days. So uh, although, as the, as the spaceweather.com uh, indicates, um, there was a storm, uh, not a very light storm at least anyway. They say that a, um, a magnetic filament in the sun's southern hemisphere did explode, uh, sending uh, debris, which apparently sailed just south of our planet. But uh, it's caused no geomagnetic storm. So at the moment, uh, I, I would say that the um, uh, that the uh, the geomagnetic nature of uh, of the, the planet at the moment is fairly stable. 
Uh, so I, I would say that you could probably deduce from that that the um, uh, the propagation wise uh, it would be situation normal. Um, so uh, there wouldn't be any, i.e. there wouldn't be any enhanced propagation uh, occurring at the moment. Um, so, but of course we're we're coming up to cycle 25. I mean we are in cycle 25 of the uh, uh, of the sun's uh, 11 year cycle and uh, it's ramping up. And uh, there is certainly a lot of activity uh, that's starting to brew uh, from the sun. So over the next few years, uh, uh, we'll reach uh, the peak of all that. And uh, again, the, the bands will just uh, will sparkle. Um, will just become very, very, very active indeed. So uh, as uh, as Timotha releases her uh, <laughs> her uh, uh, eight ten minute uh, 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 video articles, I'll uh, I'll certainly put them up here, and uh, so you, all you guys can be abreast of uh, of what's going on. Thanks, uh, Ian. No worries at all. And uh, you're you're averaging about 15 over nine, 15 to 20 over nine. So you're you're above the uh, the over horizon radar. Uh, but uh, it is uh, a bit of a nuisance having it running in the background. You'd think that they'd, uh, they'd find another frequency, wouldn't you? <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Uh, Jack, VK3TJS in Shepparton, VK3EKH. Yeah, VK3 TJS, VK3 EKH. Uh, look, sorry, uh, Jack, but I, I found that very hard to copy you that over. I, c I could hear you there. I, I could hear you talking, uh, but um, the the combination of that uh, over the horizon radar lightning crashes uh, and propagation is, uh, is is not very good for you at the moment. So unfortunately, I didn't really catch a whole lot, and that's very strange because normally you're a very good signal either way. And uh, I normally copy you uh, quite uh, clearly, so tonight's uh, tonight's a bit of a first uh, for a poor signal from you. Um, so sorry, Jack, I didn't quite catch all that. Uh, but um, uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're about you're peaking about strength nine, but the the, the noise floor here is high, and uh, the woodpecker or well, over the horizon radar thingy is uh, is is quite strong at times. Sorry, Jack, not a very good report uh, from you tonight uh, on uh, on this occasion. And David, I'm afraid it's going to be the same for you. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to have much luck in be being able to hear you, but we'll give it a go. VK2 ELS, VK3 EKH. <laughs> VK2 ELS, VK3 EKH, yeah, I think, uh, well, I, I, I think the things that I picked up on was that it was a good broadcast tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard you say at least twice that uh, it was a good broadcast tonight, so I'm glad that the, the signal uh, uh, up to uh, Coffs Harbour got through uh, reasonably well, um, although uh, I think that you were also viewing me on the, the YouTube stream too, so... Uh, and that's that's why I, I provide the the YouTube stream plus the the audio stream, which of course I, I still haven't got worked out yet. But uh, uh, you know, we, for for those distant stations that struggle to hear me on 80 meters, including 160, then that's why I provide the audio stream and the YouTube stream. So uh, it just makes that uh, a little bit easier for what it's worth. But look, yeah, thanks, Dave. No worries at all. Yeah, very hard copy on you tonight, but I did hear the. Uh, comment that it was a good broadcast so thank you for that <laughs> um, all right 
that's now across to a uh, super strong station. Uh, David, VK3 HDX, have a say, David, VK3 EKH. Uh, that would be Don Clint, uh, VK3 EKH yeah, in the group, VK3 HDX. Yeah, great broadcast tonight, Clint, thank you. Um, listened um, on both 80 and, one, uh, and 160, um, and most enjoyable as usual and uh, a thumping signal I would have seen my report anyway so um, yeah thank you and um, I assume you're uh, going up to the Starbuck here tomorrow and so uh, uh, enjoy that if you um, if you get up there I'm sure it'll uh, it'll be a lot of fun I'm going to try and do it next year but um Having just moved back and still unpacking, uh, not on not on the cards this year. Uh, but thanks again, and um, look forward to next week. VK three EKH in the group. VK three HDX. Yeah, thanks, Don. Sorry about the mix up of the name. <laughs> VK three HDX. VK three EKH returning. Very good. Yeah, thanks, Don. Good signal from you. Twenty twenty five over nine. Not a problem at all. And uh, yeah, I think by this time uh, next year, uh, we hopefully, m the majority of us should be, uh, not, not exactly over the COVID experience, but we should be in a, in a better position to, uh, to know um, uh, how things are going to be handled and uh, you know, whether masks have to be worn or not sort of thing. So uh, uh, yeah, I think it'd be, we'll know better next year. This, this year it's just been uh, all over the place. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly uh, uh, things will move along uh, for sure by this time next year. So um, yeah, look, I hope to get up there. I went for a test drive today. Actually, I drove the Subaru um, down East Link at uh, at speed. I wanted to, to uh, just to see how the. I mean, the you know my my job is 15 minutes away, so uh, my <clears throat> my car doesn't go for anything longer than 15 or maybe 30 minutes on the way home and then, then it's turned off so uh, it hasn't seen any steady uh, drive for a, a while so I went for a, uh, a drive down East Link today at speed uh, turned off at Baronia Road and uh, headed up towards Mount Dandenong uh, took a back road which I've never been along before. Uh, it's a dirt road, but it, it heads up towards uh, the back of Mount Dandenong. Beautiful. Uh, it's a, it's an area of the Dandenongs that I, I don't think I've seen before. But the trees, all the trees are a hundred feet tall. Uh, the, the the fernery is just beautiful and green. And I thought, yep, this this is the place where I could easily set up a home. <laughs> um, there there was a view between the trees looking out towards Melbourne. You could tell that you were up high. That was a beautiful view. I thought, yeah, this is just be ideal. So, but um, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but I was out uh, out in the car for uh, probably about two hours. Uh, very much a simulated uh, drive to Heathcote because the trip to Heathcote takes about two and a half hours for me. And uh, so uh, the temperature didn't vary one iota. The temperature gauge was quite stable. I I, I had the radiator replaced just a few weeks ago, and. Um, the test drive today uh, seems to re reveal that it went through okay so uh yeah i mean it's a bit different bit, i mean driving up the him highway and, and uh, northern highway it's uh it's uh, it's slightly different but uh um, I'm, I'm gonna it's not, i'm not gonna rest and you know, i'll be constantly looking at the temperature gauge and if i can get all the way to uh, to heathcote and the, the temperature control is is what well, gauge is perfect then i'll be I'll be happy. I can relax on the trip home. Anyway, enough of that. Um, but thanks, Don. All right. Now, uh, and of course, uh, now uh, VK3CAH was a check in. No worries. And was there any other stations wishing to check in? VK3EKH, listening. VK7JAH. Ah, g'day, Martin. Go ahead. Um, we'll see down here on hearing most of the stories taken for a while, which is uh, a little bit of a challenge sometimes, so actually fairly clear tonight, uh, actual signal, uh, we're on 25 and 9. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, you're 5 and 9 plus uh, 15, 10 to 15, uh, QS being between 10 and 15 over, so it's the best signal I've heard from you uh, from Tasmania, so it's very, very, very good. Uh, it's interesting how the propagation isn't favouring inland uh, at the moment, but uh, certainly down towards uh, 
Tasmania, it's very, very good indeed. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Martin. Thanks for uh, checking in. Good, uh, good signal from you indeed. Uh, is there anybody else? VK3 EKH? VK3 EKH, VK3 uh, VAT. Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry about the power off. 30 watts. Um, yeah, all good here. Um, Richard said to uh, give his apologies because he couldn't make it. Um, yeah, that's about it. Another good job. Well done. And I'll uh, leave it there. VK3 EKH, VK3 VAT. Yeah, thanks, Tony. VK3 VAT. Local ham, VK3 EKH returning. All right, well, you're in the log and you're recorded as 40 over 9. <laughs> All right, on that note, I think I'll close down the session for tonight. Um, and uh, by the way, I just did quickly check YouTube. Uh, that uh, video stream um, from the ASV meeting last week is available. Uh, I did have it here. Um, oh my God, I'm closing everything down as I go. Uh, where is it? Here it is. Yeah. So it's called Deeper, Wider, Faster. So it's already had 102 views, streamed two days ago. Uh, it's called Machine Learning in Astronomy and Using It To, something or other. And uh, if you just type in the Astronomical Society of Victoria in your favourite search engine on YouTube, <laughs> um, you'll quickly find it. It's called Deeper, Wider, Faster. And uh, it's a, a short interview, or sorry, a short uh, uh, speech, um, a presentation uh, by Sarah Webb. And, uh, um, and you'll also hear the comment from Perry about the comet and uh, how comets um, are like cats. Uh, they, um, they all have tails and do whatever they want to do. So uh, it's a quote from Perry, although that quote actually co goes back to 2003, I think it is, and comes from David Levy. Um, David Levy is known as, uh, is known as a, yeah, a great uh, discoverer of comets uh, and uh, other astronom astronomical objects, and he's written a, a number of books on how to, to uh, chase comets, and uh, in his book on uh, Guide to... Um, uh, to uh, looking for uh, uh, comets, he, that's where he used the phrase that uh, uh, comets are, uh, are like cats. They they all have tails and uh, they do whatever they want to do. <laughs> anyway, that was fitting the way Perry said that at the end of the broadcast, uh, end of the um, the show on uh, Wednesday night. So you can see that um, on YouTube. On that. Cheers, everyone. To anybody who's up there at uh, Heathcote, at the Dark Sky site, that may be still listening, thank you for listening. If I do show up tomorrow, if you do see me, come across to the Radio Astronomy Lab and say hi, and it uh, be great to, uh, to catch up with uh, everybody up there for sure for a few hours. I'll be probably heading back before midnight, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, it'll be good to, uh, to be up there once again. This has been a broadcast from the Astronomical Society of Victoria's official station, VK3 EKH, concluding transmissions for tonight. And uh, we'll see you all next Friday at the same time uh, at 10 o'clock. This is VK3 EKH QRT. QRT. Alright, to everybody watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. And uh, we'll. Uh, We'll uh, be back next week to do it all again. So um, uh, thank you for watching. It's been makes it always worth it. Where's VMix? Where's my VMix program? There it is, VMix. And I shall stop, stop the stream. Cheers to everybody watching the stream. Bye. Stop the stream. Yes. All right. <laughs>